Welcome back, boils and ghouls. Remember, if you enjoy these videos, do me a favor. Hit that like button. Think about sharing these videos with your friends. Get in the comments section below and let me know. And if you really enjoy what you see, make sure you hulk smash that subscribe button. If you feel like you're in a position to help the channel grow, think about signing up for my Patreon page for channel updates and exclusive content. If Patreon isn't your thing, but you still want to support the channel, there are links to jerk comic shirts and tons of other merch, as well as my Patreon in the description below. Thanks to everyone who's already supporting the channel. I can't tell you how much it means to me, but now don't worry, you're not lost. You're just off the beaten rack. In this episode, I wanted to talk about Barry Windsor Smith's Weapon X, but the thing is, there's like no information out there about it. Windsor Smith is rather notorious and doesn't do a ton of interviews or talk a lot about his work for Marvel in general. So instead of just covering what little I could find, I instead put together a short 30 minute rundown on Windsor Smith's career, leading up to and including Weapon X and everything I could find out about that. Starting from his work at Marvel in the late 60s and running through his time at Valiant, we'll discuss the career of a man who has had an inexorable effect on the industry despite an inordinately limited output, all while we thumb through a trade paperback of the collected Weapon X story. So kick back, relax, and enjoy as we take a tantalizing trip through this twisted piece of genius and of course talk some serious shop while we do it. So let's head on over to the table and check it out. So, I am working on editing the graphic fantasy Savage Dragon episode, but while it was fresh in my mind, and because I happen to know a lot about it, I thought we would flip through this brand new trade paperback of Weapon X that I hit, well it is not new, it's from the 90s, but uh, it's new to me. I got it with a, a lot of other books, and I thought we would flip through this and just kind of check it out. Now, Barry Windsor Smith is a name that I think most of us like older viewers are going to be extremely familiar with. He, he burst onto the scene in the late 1960s, February of 1969, I think is his first work for Marvel. And uh, he worked on like sporadic weird issues of Daredevil, Thor, he did some Doctor Strange stories, The Avengers, X-Men, Fantastic Four, Hulk, and he even did some Nick Fury. Now Marvel had him do a story for a uh, title that they had called Chamber of Darkness in issue four. And it's called Star the Slayer, and it basically features a prototype of Conan the Barbarian. Uh, Marvel was testing the water, and based on the popularity of that issue, Marvel did license Conan with the help of Roy Thomas from the Howard Estate. Now, Marvel actually didn't want to originally license Conan as it was more expensive. But Roy Thomas, who basically doubled the budget of the book from $150 to $250 an issue to pay for royalties, was basically the guy who knew they really wanted something a cut above everybody else, so they got Conan. But the thing was, because they were paying more for the royalties, they didn't have money to pay more for an artist. Now, Barry Windsor Smith was extremely popular and he was known among fans even from the very beginning, but because he was newer, he wasn't as expensive, and that's actually how he ended up on the book. Now, uh, fans almost immediately fell in love with Barry Windsor Smith, and he actually hadn't added the Windsor to his name yet, so he's actually still Barry Smith. And based on the popularity of all the work that he'd done, and the fact that they just really wanted to get this Conan the Barbarian series going, they hired him for the series in 1970. Now, originally, he had a very different style. His early work was actually billed as a combination of Jim Steronko and Jack Kirby, if you can believe it looking at these pages. Uh, his work on Conan did quickly evolve into the more sophisticated, very heavy ink and line work that we think of. One of the interesting things about the Conan the Barbarian series, while I'm totally off subject and rambling about it now, is the fact that before that series, Conan wasn't really known as a barbarian. It had been years before when the term was last used with Conan, I think for a trade paperback or something, 
And Howard never refers to Conan as a barbarian in the source material. It had been decades since it was used to describe Conan, and Barry Windsor Smith is the reason that Conan is Conan the Barbarian. Barry Windsor Smith didn't actually consciously make Conan a barbarian, I don't think. The most popular and the most widespread versions of the books that were available at the time all sported covers by Frank Frazetta. And so this was the image that came to Barry Windsor Smith's mind when he thought of Conan the Barbarian. Now, Frank Frazetta's paintings show him as a barbaric maniac, killing and maiming people. So without Frazetta, Barry Windsor Smith would probably never have leaned into the concept like he did. And without Barry Windsor Smith, Conan definitely wouldn't be known as Conan the Barbarian today. It's pretty interesting. Um, now, Weapon X is probably the most highly lauded work that Barry Windsor Smith ever did, but Red Nails is a Conan story, and it is still considered one of the best comic series ever written, and it's definitely one of the best that I've ever read. So if you get a chance to check it out, I highly recommend it. There's also even a uh, artist edition of that which I think Dynamite released. Uh, I cannot recommend it enough, and I imagine looking at his original art would be absolutely incredible. I haven't had a chance to pick it up. I am a broke man. He got more and more popular on Conan, but he had more and more problems with Marvel during this period, like 1970, 71, 72. He did a bunch of stories uh, for Marvel throughout 71 and 72 for stuff like Iron Man and Marvel premiere, but he didn't like any of the characters and he got bored of the work really fast. And essentially, I think what broke the camel's back on this one was Stan Lee basically rewrote the Iron Man and the Marvel premiere issue stories, which featured Doctor Strange, after Smith had already turned in the art and this really miffed him. He'd already quit on at least one occasion, if not two, from Conan which is why he didn't do issues 17 or 18 of Conan the Barbarian, which are the only two issues that he didn't work on between 1970 and 73 when, when he quit comics altogether. Now, he left comics in the end of 1973 after having a, quote, mind-altering, life-changing experience. I'm going to assume that like a lot of other guys that went totally batty Barry Windsor Smith probably got a hold of some acid and thought he tapped into like some sort of higher level of thought or something. It, 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 Barry Windsor Smith can be pretentious and he has a hard time getting along with even other artists and writers and he really does like to trash talk. In 1975, after leaving comics, Barry Windsor Smith started the studio along with a couple of other really outspoken and super talented guys, uh, Bernie Wrightson, Catherine Dre Jeffrey Jones, and Mike Kaluta. Now the studio didn't last long, but it was important as basically all of the artists were not only superstar comic guys, but they also made the leap into fine art. And some of the first mainstream artists outside of people like Frank Frazetta to achieve this kind of success in the fine arts world were the guys from the studio. They made it possible, they were very confident of their talents, they knew they were good, and they had no problems telling people, trying to get their work into uh, you know, exhibits and actual galleries and stuff. It was really cool and it was important. Uh, the studio was around for maybe three and a half years and they actually ended up releasing a book of the work that they produced during their time together, which was aptly named The Studio in 1979, which is the same year that the studio disbanded and everyone went their own separate ways. Barry Windsor Smith struggled to make it as a fine artist, and I think his personality is the thing that probably prevented him from having any real success. And then it got in the way of basically everything that he's ever did and while the studio was breaking up, he started his own publishing company, uh, Gore Blimey Press. Now, Gore Blimey Press released a bunch of portfolios from Barry Windsor Smith between the end of 1973 and the end of 1976. Now, Gore Blimey is still technically around, but I think the last thing that they actually released is Libera Mono in 1993, which was a portfolio by uh, Barry Windsor Smith. They did put out stuff during the 1980s, 
but it was spotty, if I recall. You have to remember too, though, this was before the internet. And it was before I was aware that you could like send letters to people and have correspondences with like other people that liked comic books. I lived in this little town in the southernmost tip of Illinois and I was not exactly privy to all of the amazing things that were taking place during the 1980s because number one of the guys who ran the local shop where I got books and number two because that was the single place I got information about comics and comic related stuff. The most famous thing that Gore Blimey ever put out was a collection of Barry Windsor Smith's work from 1973 to 1976 called the Gore Blimey Press Catalog. It's a super cool piece. And in my amazement, when I was researching it, and I think that kind of a testament to how difficult it was to get a hold of these when they came out and were new, and how difficult Barry Windsor Smith is to deal with, you can still order copies directly from Barry Windsor Smith's official website for like 70 bucks as of the recording of this video in April of 2021. He wasn't out hustling, he wasn't out promoting, and despite the fact that Gore Blimey was around for decades and is still technically his active self-publishing imprint, they've never managed to sell this thing out. It's never been used for comic related material, just prints and folios that I know of, so that might be one of the reasons, but I still found it insane. That book came out in 1976. So in 1981, he was hired by Oliver Stone to draw the fictitious Mandro comic strip for Stone's movie, The Hand. While Barry Windsor Smith had been retired from the comics industry for almost six years at that point, Oliver Stone still remembered him enough that he tracked him down and got him to do the strip for his movie. And within two years, Barry Windsor Smith was back working with Marvel again. Uh, Machine Man was probably the highest profile thing that he worked on during his initial return to Marvel. And Machine Man might have been his big comeback. He was working on the series with Herb Trimpey, who Barry Windsor Smith says he was friends with him on his official page. According to Barry Windsor Smith, Trimpey approached him about inking his layouts in 1984 and as kind of a way back into the industry. But by the third issue, quote, he was not only inking Trimpey's pencils, but redoing some of his friend's layouts and drawings as well. And that Herb Trimpey then, quote, stepped aside and let his friend finish the fourth issue himself. I've also heard another version of this story that casts Barry Windsor Smith in a slightly uh, less positive light, where Trimpey, who should have been a legend but never got the respect that he was due, was essentially pushed off of the series as, as Barry Windsor Smith exerted more and more and more control and rewrote more stuff. Marvel wanted him back. They were talking about reprinting his old Conan material, and they basically gave him the series by the end to try and get him to stay on board with the company. I can't say I know which version is true, but I do know that Trimpey definitely never got the love that he deserved. And also, as Machine Man moved along, Barry Windsor Smith did eventually do that fourth issue all on his own, which is something that would become integral to Barry Windsor Smith's magnum opus, Weapon X. I also don't know if it's just hard to work with him or it takes a long time to do stuff or both maybe, but his output was next to zilch even when he came back to Marvel. He put out about a dozen issues for them between 1983 and 1989, two of which appear in the same issue of Epic actually. So. Despite all of their problems, after like two years of doing nothing for them, Barry Windsor Smith released the Weapon X story beginning in 1991. It was originally serialized in Marvel Comics Presents number 73. No, no. It was originally serialized in Marvel Comics Presents 72 through 74. Barry Windsor Smith penciled, he inked, he wrote, and he even helped letter Weapon X. It was his baby. And along with the Conan Red Nails story, it's regarded as one of the greatest comic stories ever written and definitely the greatest stuff that Barry Windsor Smith has ever done. Now, it basically came out of nowhere. 
Not only was Mary Windsor Smith not really active in the industry at that point, but Wolverine was in the dumps during the 90s. He was popular basically because John Byrne had pushed him to the forefront, but Chris Claremont didn't like him and he didn't really like writing for him. And they had no clue what his origin was or who Logan really was. So if you, and if you want to learn more about that, check out my video about the mysteriously shared origin of Wolverine and Spider-Man. It's, it is insane. It's crazy. I cannot, I still can't believe some of the weird stuff that they tried with Wolverine back then. So when people think of Wolverine now, they think of a dark brooding, like savage feral beast, right? Claremont and Byrne always made him out to be super tough. And one of the few heroes that was willing to kill but it was Barry Windsor Smith who really defined what people think of as Wolverine today. In Weapon X, the details of what happened to Wolverine were revealed for the first time, and they are not pretty. Weapon X reads a lot like a horror film, if you take it that way. It has a lot in common with Immortal Hulk and the John Carpenter's version of The Thing. It's body horror like no other. We're seeing a lot of that right now, but at the beginning of the story, a secret cabal of unknown Canadian scientists and high ups uh, track down Logan. They knock him out and they kidnap him after a uh, night of binge drinking. And they take him back to this lab and they tranquilize him. And the first chapter is told from Wolverine's perspective, but the rest of the series is from a myriad of different people's point of view, including, quote, the professor, which is all we ever know him as, and his two assistants, Abraham Cornelius, and his assistant, Carol Hines. I have never heard it brought up before, but if you check out the computer screen at the beginning of this story, it is a case file on Wolverine, known as Logan at this point, and his service for either the Canadian police force or the military, it doesn't say, I don't think, but it does say that he accidentally shot one of the people who ran the shooting range in the head because he had the shakes from alcohol withdrawal. This story is so dark and it only gets darker from there. After they kidnap Wolverine and they take him to the secret lab, the professor shows up and the narration of the book shifts in an interesting direction. Rather than the usual like bubbles of narrative uh, dialogue or the blocks of narration, Barry Windsor Smith uses excerpts of dialogue, which allows the story to kind of unfold in a much more organic and a very unique way as opposed to most comics. The layout preceded the extensive toying with panels that guys like Sam Keith and Todd McFarlane would take to the next level with their image work in 1992 and 1993, only like a year after this story came out. Weapon X has been reprinted a ton of times, but unfortunately, only on either heavy Baxter paper or slick glossy paper. Now, Barry Windsor Smith colored Weapon X himself. And if you look at the original Marvel Comics Presents comic books, the floppies, the paper was way different back then. It was still basically newsprint. It soaked up the ink and it had a very distinctive color palette and a very unique aesthetic and feel to it. When the story is reprinted on this heavy Baxter paper, or worse yet, the slick high gloss stuff, the colors look absolutely garish. They're almost fluorescent and the blacks are so dark that they kind of bleed together and they end up muddying the composition of the pages. The result is this cobbled mess of like blobs and black messes of neon colors popping out. Track down the floppies if you can. They're cheap and totally worth reading and owning. Believe it or not, despite the fact that he hasn't worked for them in years, decades actually, I mean, at least on, on in interiors and, and on an ongoing, but anyway, not only does Barry Windsor Smith's website point out the fact that this color is absolutely terrible, but it claims that Barry Windsor Smith has actually tried to contact Marvel to get the subsequent reprintings of this book corrected with no success. If this is true, 
It is just another testament to how hard he has been to deal with if they won't even return his calls about coloring. In 2006, Marvel finally did try and get Barry Windsor Smith to like help put out the quote definitive Weapon X. And Barry Windsor Smith came up with more than 50 unused pages and unfinished pages, including a completely different ending that has never been seen. Unfortunately, as is usually the case with Marvel and Barry Windsor Smith, stuff absolutely fell through, and I don't think any of those pages have or may ever see the light of day, at least while Barry Windsor Smith is around. Now, this stuff with the coloring is super weird, because when Dark Horse released a series of Conan collections called the Barry Windsor Smith Archives of work from the Marvel series in the 1970s, they absolutely mangled it. The new inking and the reproductions uh, of the colors murdered the original details, and the colors look almost as bad as this early 90s trade paperback, and the inking looks worse. Overall, those Barry Windsor Smith archives are some of the worst reproductions I have ever seen that are not just straight bootlegs. I don't know if Barry Windsor Smith had words with them about it, but here's the weird part. Despite not correcting the colors of inking for Weapon X, when Marvel got the license back to Conan uh, like two years ago, back in 2019, I think, from Dark Horse, they themselves released a series of Conan omnibuses that chronicled the entire back catalog of Marvel material, including the Barry Windsor Smith material. The inking in these releases is way closer to Barry Windsor Smith's original art, and the colors look like they were actually manually adjusted to compensate for the insane jump in saturation and exposure that basically destroyed Barry Windsor Smith's art in any Weapon X reproductions. Maybe it's just because Barry Windsor Smith didn't bother them about it and they learned their lesson, or maybe because people were seriously bagging on those Dark Horse releases. Man, were they bad. So as the story progresses, we see the professor is this absolutely evil sick sadist of a man who seems to get like pleasure out of t torturing Wolverine, who they have like brainwashed and tranquilized. They like wipe his memory and they begin to implant control devices to allow them to remotely operate his body as a weapon. The scenes of this surgery are particularly disturbing as we hear these bits of dialogue about the wounds trying to heal and uh, the sutures and clamps and the skin around them, like trying to seal around them. And we find out that Wolverine is also awake during the entire surgery and they don't want to damage Wolverine. So basically they don't want to fully sedate him. It's absolutely, it, it's awful. The staff starts to feel increasingly bad about what they're doing, but the professor is absolutely unwavering and he's an absolutely totally evil, crazy person as per comic books. Now, if you remember the early 90s Toy Biz action figure Wolverine like covered in electrical wires and a pair of uh, brown short shorts, then you know that Marvel was busy cashing in on this series and selling it as basically his origin. Well, every attempt that had basically been made at giving Wolverine a backstory had failed or backfired in the past. Again, see my Wolverine Spider-Woman episode if you're in doubt. But every time they tried, it just, it fell apart. It fell flat. Fans didn't like it. The fans loved Weapon X and Marvel sold it as his origin. Although it only explains basically why he's so mysterious and doesn't really tell you anything about his actual origin or history apart from his small few clues and bits, like him shooting that guy in the head and getting fired either from the police force or kicked out of the army. Uh, the scientists and the professor running Weapon X don't even know that Wolverine is a mutant, but the shadowy cabal of people pulling the strings behind the scenes, of course, do. Now, the professor is obsessed with making the perfect killing machine, and you see Wolverine turned into this absolutely feral creature throughout this story. Wolverine had been fierce in the past, but the scene with Wolverine fighting the bear and cutting off its head turned him into the berserker that we know of today. That or the fight with the wolves later, which is also super cool, but I'm pretty sure it was the bear. 
One of the things that I don't like about Weapon X is the way that Barry Windsor Smith has the narrative dialogue laid out in these like impossible to follow patterns. I'm dyslexic and dysgraphic, so maybe I'm biased, but it's one of the biggest critiques of the book that I see from other people as well. I know it sounds like a small thing, but if you read it, when you're done reading it the second time in the right order, you'll get what I'm talking about. Now, I read an interview with Barry Windsor Smith where he talked about a friend of his wife who was a big fan of his and his wife, both of them complaining about the same thing, which is about the only detail I could come up with in interviews with Barry Windsor Smith about Weapon X. But given how popular Weapon X was, I wondered why he had never done a sequel, why he didn't do interviews. Now, granted, he does like no work anyway, but still, it turns out it's because he left Marvel almost before Weapon X was out and he started working with Valiant in the end of 1991. Now, because basically because he was working with Valiant under Jim Shooter, and I doubt that he had much interest anyways, he didn't do any of the even short promotional interviews that you would usually see around this area. Instead, the greatest single Wolverine story ever told was basically ignored by the guy who wrote, drew, and colored the entire thing. At this point, Valiant was run by Jim Shooter, like I mentioned, and I do honestly believe that Jim Shooter has been blacklisted by a great deal of people inside of very prominent companies out there, and he has been since the 80s. I don't know if it's warranted, and I don't want to get into that here, but I do think that it is true. So when Barry Windsor Smith hopped on in bed with Valiant, and therefore, which was perceived as hopping in bed with Jim Shooter's company, he was done with Marvel. They never had a good relationship anyway, so I don't think Barry Windsor Smith cared or cares, but he's kind of a pretentious guy, and he doesn't really get along with fans or critics very well, so interviews are few and far between. In the few interviews where he does hit on Weapon X, he usually just talks about how no one got it, and then he goes off on a tangent about something about Valiant, and that's about the end of that. I always thought his work for Valiant was actually kind of lackluster, and I am not a big fan of Bob Layton either, or the way they colored their entire line of books so blandly. So Barry Windsor Smith completely lost me at Valiant, and I kind of lost track of him. I, I really did like uh, Solar. Yes, I know it's Solar, Man of the Atom. I'm sorry, that's how I've been saying it since I was a kid. I just can't help it. I love Solar, Man of the Atom, but the art just never worked for me. There's only a couple of sequences in those original issues that I really like art-wise. It was the story that got me. And it turns out he's had an almost laughably bad run of luck with the rights to his characters following Weapon X. He did Archer and Armstrong for Valiant. It's a good book. I'm not gonna beef on that. The art's good, the story's good, um, and he spent several years fighting over ownership of that, only to, I think, basically either lose or find out that it was a non-winnable battle. And then he helped create Rune for Malibu's Ultraverse, which was summarily consumed by Marvel simply so that they could get their hands on Malibu's cutting edge color team. It was horrendous. I'm not even a, a massive Ultraverse or Malibu fan. I'm just now starting to, to discover what I think are kind of their hidden gems, but that is awful. I wouldn't wish that fate on my worst enemy. Now, because the rights at both Valiant and Malibu got so completely jacked up, Rune has never been reprinted. Some people claim this is because Marvel would have to pay not only Barry Windsor Smith and the other creator of Rune, but also people from Malibu money to use the characters. Marvel and Joe Cusada, who made the deal to swallow up Ultraverse, deny this summarily, but they also refuse to comment on why they can't use the character. It's kind of a great unsolved mystery at this point as a lot of material and stuff from the 1990s is actually rising to prominence. And some of those back issues are actually gaining steam with collectors and speculators because they can't be reprinted. 
And a lot of them were basically bought by only people who read the books and they read them. So they're not in like mint collector condition. Now, Archer and Armstrong was caught up in some sort of legal trouble all of its own. I know Voyager Communications got bought out by a claim in 1994 who basically screwed the pooch and went bankrupt in 2004. Then in 2005, forgive me, uh, I think it's Dinesh Shamdasani and Jason Kothari or Kothari. They bought the rights to the original Valiant characters uh, from an auction with the rights to the original Dell Gold Key characters like Solar and a few other guys going back to Dell Gold Key who are now actually owned by DreamWorks. Now Dinesh and Kothari started publishing again in 2012, like eight years later. And there's new Archer and Armstrong, but nothing of Barry Windsor Smith's original stuff had been reprinted for years. In 2016, after almost 14 years, the Barry Windsor Smith, Archer and Armstrong was collected for an omnibus hardcover, but that went out of print and it now commands hundreds of dollars on the secondhand market. And that's only a few short, like five years later. While the rights might be messy with Valiant, given the hardcover, I'm guessing that it's probably Dinesh and Kothari didn't work out long lasting rights and it was a one-time deal and there is an ongoing problem. Barry Windsor Smith spent years talking mad trash about Image Comics, their style, and then once Valiant and Malibu imploded, he went to work for them. At one point, he was working on a series called Wild Storm Rising, and he managed to, I mean, he seriously pissed off James Robinson, and it was because in issue one, he quote, got bored, and what he did was he decided to just start changing the story to entertain himself as he drew it. James Robinson was not a fan. Uh, that like Since then, he's done a few things, all of them lackluster. There was a repurposed X-Men story done um, with his series, Young Gods. And uh, he also did a series called Freebooters. It's really mediocre material, uh, art-wise, writing-wise, I have not been impressed. Supposedly, that is kind of for a reason, apparently. He's been holed up, working on this new graphic novel of his, Monsters, which comes out on April 27th of this year in 2021, for something like three and a half decades. He's been doing it in his downtime and reworking and rewriting it. I don't know. The plot sounds really bonkers. There's like monsters and Nazis and stuff. So according to the official Fanagraphics press release, quote unquote, Fanagraphics is proud to present Monsters, the legendary project Barry Windsor Smith has been working on for over 35 years. A 380 page, Tour de force of visual storytelling, Monsters narrative canvas is both vast and deep. Part familial drama, part political thriller, part metaphysical journey, it is an intimate portrait of individuals struggling to reclaim their lives and an epic political odyssey across two generations of American history. Trauma, fate, conscience, and redemption are just a few of the themes that intersect in the most ambitious graphic novel of Barry Windsor Smith's career. I mean, I'll be checking it out, but I don't know if it will be like his magnum opus. I don't know if it's going to be worth 35 years of work. I guess only time will tell. What I can say is that Weapon X is absolutely magnificent. It, it did redefine Wolverine, not in the 90s, uh, not for the 2000s. It redefined Wolverine. It's not going anywhere. And that being said, it's a real travesty. You can't get this with its original color scheme. I mean, garish coloring. It's terrible. It does this series absolutely no justice. I highly recommend picking this up in the original floppies. Uh, yes, I wish that uh, we got that 50 pages of extra material. Yeah, I wish Barry Windsor Smith would get involved in a, on any level with a re-release of this book. 
Or at least Marvel would get off of their guff and do a really good version of it. Um, when a book has an outro, like an epilogue by Larry Hama, talking about how it is a magnificent piece of writing and storytelling, I think it's time to maybe shut up and pay attention. And I'm not saying that people don't pay attention to the story because it's Weapon X and it did redefine stuff, but it's the content, the story of this series that I hear most people latch onto, not the actual Marvel Comics Presents run at this point. Probably because it was in Marvel Comics Presents, which is not a, ho a high profile series. It's not collectible, it's not worth a lot of money. Spec buyers don't pick it up. Collectors really don't pick it up. It's a dollar bin type of thing for the most part. And for another reason, Barry Windsor Smith has disappeared from the freaking industry because he's impossible to deal with. And he's had negative interactions with his fans. He's fairly secluded. He's always been that way. Uh, good example, that book that we talked about, the Gore Blimey Press catalog from 1976 that he's still selling original copies of. So go out, check out this series. It really is worth reading. Thanks for sticking with me. I hope you all enjoyed, maybe even learned something. As always, a list of my sources as well as links to any digitally available sources and further reading can be found in the description below. If you did like what you see, make sure you hit that like button, get in the comment section below and let me know and think about sharing these videos with your friends. If you really enjoyed what you saw, make sure you Hulk smash that subscribe button. If you do that, make sure you ding the little notification bell so you never miss another video. If you feel like you're in a position to help support the channel, there are links in the description below to shirts and tons of other merch, as well as my Patreon page where you can get updates and behind the scenes info, as well as discount codes for merch and exclusive content. And speaking of Patreon, as always, this episode of today Today's trivia was made possible by contributions to the Jerk Comic Broadcasting System by the generous viewers you see on the screen now. I also want to personally thank my loyal Wednesday Warrior Patreons, Mike Dolan, David Arroyo, and Robert Chamberlain. You guys make these videos possible. If you'd like your name in the credits or a personal shout out, check out the link to my Patreon page for details. And I promise as soon as I get payment stuff worked out with YouTube, I will also open up the subscriber feature here as well. I want to seriously thank every one of you who's supporting the channel as well as every one of you who's ordered shirts and stickers. I really appreciate it and I can't wait to see where this next year takes us as the channel continues to evolve and grow. But that's enough for me. Thanks again for sticking with me. I hope you all enjoyed, maybe even learned something. And as always, I really truly and honestly ask only two things. Keep hitting those local shops and keep reading comics.